Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. The AQCon nuclear network was first introduced to the public in early 2004 with Abdul Qadir Khan's dramatic, televised confession to the Pakistani public that he had participated in selling nuclear technology, including bomb-making designs and equipment, to countries including Iran, North Korea, and Libya. Right from the beginning, the sensational nature of the network and its eventual discovery, a tale of international intrigue and shadowy spycraft, seemed tailor-made for headline-grabbing reports or sensationalistic BBC docudramas. A nuclear network reaching as far as North Korea. I will not stand by as peril draws closer and closer. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. But the West did too little, too late. It could have been stopped, without any doubt in my mind. I think it's one of the, the biggest failures in history. So we're all going to pay the price. By now, much has been reported on the Kent Con network and its eventual unraveling. As is typical with these events, a popular understanding has emerged around the early reporting on the subject, one that suggests that Dr. Khan was working essentially off the radar and out of sight of the intelligence agencies whose very existence is predicated on identifying such threats long before they develop. And as is also typical with these events, that popular understanding is completely wrong. In fact, as we now know, Khan and his network were known, identified, surveilled, funded, and even protected by the CIA from its very inception. In 1974, Abdul Qadir Khan offered his services to the Pakistani government to help them develop a nuclear bomb. Within a year, he was already under investigation by the BVD, a Dutch intelligence service. The BVD informed the CIA that they were going to arrest Khan for passing nuclear secrets to Pakistan, but the CIA told them to let him continue his operation. According to former Dutch Economic Affairs Minister Rude Lubbers, the Americans wished to follow and watch Khan to get more information. Around the same time, the NSA began monitoring a group of German and Swiss companies supplying high-tech parts for developing nuclear weaponry. According to a Seymour Hirsch report for The New Yorker in 1993, the company's telexes and facsimile transmissions were routinely intercepted and translated for signs of nuclear trafficking with Pakistan. Through their efforts, American intelligence agencies were able to obtain the floor plans for Kahuta, the nuclear enrichment plant that Khan's network was helping to build, before it had even been constructed. Once Kahuta was online, the CIA was able to obtain first-hand information about its day-to-day -day operations. In the mid-1980s, a CIA analyst named Richard Barlow learned of an attempt by a Pakistani businessman to purchase equipment for its nuclear program for an American company. The deal involved well-known Pakistani government operatives, and so a sting was set up in a bugged hotel room to catch them in the act. However, two high-ranking U.S. government officials tipped off the Pakistanis about the sting and the main target, a retired brigadier in the Pakistani army. Barlow and others in the agency demanded an inquiry into the blatantly illegal activity, but the investigation was dropped. When he tried to tell the truth about what happened during a congressional hearing, he was denounced by his own manager and eventually forced out of his position. Barlow appeared on the Boiling Frog Post podcast in 2009 to discuss the details of his case. My career was ruined there, and so I left. I went to customs as an agent, briefly, and then for family reasons, I ended up going to the office of the Secretary of Defense, the new, our new Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, January 1st of 1989. I was, I was hired by the Lower Downs, you know, to beef up this area, the enforcement role in the counterproliferation area of um, the Office of Secretary of Defense. And I was also, and the intelligence. There, there, I was the first intelligence officer in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. There never had been one. So, once again, here I was going after the Con Network. When the DO found I, out I was there, they engaged in extraordinary activities. They denied me access to sort of compartmented intelligence on Pakistan that I had until the day that I left the agency. I, I, had, I had a completely, utterly spotless security record. I had a 
super high level performance evaluation before I left. There was nothing on me. And they tried to create the appearance. I mean, I had the CIA Directorate of Operations, the Pakistan people, by the way, not security, the Pakistan people in the CIA DO running operations against me to try to make it appear that I was some kind of a security risk extending, not just in Washington, all the way to London, where I traveled with Ambassador Kennedy to, to attend the bilaterals with the British. It was unbelievable, right in front of the British. And the concerns developed at the agency and the DO and elsewhere in the State Department that here was Richard again working with federal agents to try to bust the AQCon network. And they didn't want that. There were numerous other intelligence operatives, spies, and moles in the so-called Khan network. Mohammed Farouk, the uncle of the network's so-called chief financial officer, cashed a check from the Iranian Atomic Energy Agency in 1987 for $3 million. Both a Pakistani military source and Khan himself have fingered Farouk as a CIA agent. No effort was ever made by the U.S. to locate Farouk after the unraveling of the network. One of the families that helped establish the network in the mid-1970s the Tinner family of Switzerland, have recently been identified as CIA operatives in the network. In 2010, it was announced that the long investigation into the Tinner's role in the nuclear black market has been hampered by the fact that the Swiss government itself destroyed numerous documents relating to their case, including plans for nuclear weapons and technologies, at the insistence of the CIA. In 2000, the network was independently discovered by a diligent British customs investigator, Atif Amin, who uncovered its activities in Dubai. When he went to his bosses with the evidence, his investigation was shut down. When his story made its way into a book in 2007, his home was raided on the pretense that he had broken the Official Secrets Act. After a two-year ordeal of official persecution, Amin finally saw justice in 2010 when the British government announced that they had found no evidence whatsoever that he had leaked any sensitive information. Earlier this week, I had the chance to talk to Pulitzer-nominated journalist Joseph Trento, editor of DCBureau.org and the co-author with David Armstrong of America and the Islamic Bomb, The Deadly Compromise, about an article he wrote last year about Adif Amin's extraordinary story. It's one of the great outrages of, uh, of the way our intelligence services work and the influence they have over their governments. Atif Amin was a very high-level customs officer in the British Royal Customs Service, a very smart guy of, of Pakistani extraction, and it was unusual for somebody of his background to rise to the level he did. Amin um, uh, became known to us as we worked on the research for the book, and he wouldn't talk to us. When when CS wouldn't talk to us, uh, we learned that he discovered the AQ Khan Network's operations in Dubai in 2000, April of 2000, uh, and it became very clear in our investigation that MI6, the British External Intelligence Service, and the CIA and MI5 all had reasons for not letting him continue with the investigation. When he attempted to continue in the investigation and shut down some of these operations, working with the local Dubai police, uh, they stopped him. And what's amazing is uh, in 2003, when the network was made public and George Bush made a big deal about how this was going to uh, going to become a very uh, uh, big operation, we we um, we uh, learned that it could have been stopped three years earlier. And that was the great outrage. Inevitably, however. As happens every time that an intelligence operation leads to some catastrophic result, the incompetence theory is trotted out as a way to explain what happened. The underlying assumption is that the intelligence agencies, although necessarily engaged in underhanded dealings, are only staffed by agents and headed by officials who are only interested in the well-being of the country's national interests, and the entire affair is blamed on the stupidity of those involved. So too in the Khan case, it is argued that the CIA, despite infesting every layer of this plot, somehow remained completely oblivious to Khan's efforts to proliferate these weapons to North Korea, Iran, and Libya, until it was already too late. The intelligence team knew Libya wanted to buy nuclear weapons materials, and suspected Khan was prepared to sell them. The question was, what to do about it? We had to make a decision. Do we stop this activity, or do we watch it? Uh, longer uh, in the hope of understanding it better so that when we moved against it we could uh, take it out by the roots. 
and it was clearly the preference in Washington to watch it, track it better, and when we understand it better and feel we can eradicate it uh, more completely, to take action only then. The assumption that the agents involved in these operations and the officials overseeing them are working in the best interest of their country, however, bears closer scrutiny. There is a long documented history of the United States arming its enemies, a practice that is later used as justification for military intervention in those same areas that it is dealing with. Iraq invaded Iran in September of 1980. It is important to note that the ban on the sale of weapons was in force until 1982 when it was lifted with the strong objections from Congress. The U.S. began the transfer of helicopters to Iraq in December of 1982. In 1983, Banco Nacional de Lavoro of Italy and its branch in Atlanta began to funnel five billion dollars in unreported loans to Iraq with the blessing and official approval of the U.S. government. In 2009 alone, European governments, including Britain and France, sold Libya almost $500 million worth of weapons, including fighter jets, guns, bombs. And before it started calling for regime change, the Obama administration was working to provide Muammar Gaddafi almost another $100 million in weapons, on top of the $17 million it gave in 2009 and the $46 million the Bush administration gave in 2008. Yemen has received over $300 million in military aid from the U.S. over the last five years. Obama administration continues to support the corrupt thug and president for life, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who recently ordered a, mass ordered a massacre of more than 50 of his own people. Let's stop selling weapons to people who we end up bombing. There is also the question of what happens when the politicians in charge of monitoring these programs are not acting in their country's interests. One of the proponents of the incompetence theory in this accidental arming of America's enemies is David Albright, president of the Institute for Science and International Security. In his 2010 book, Peddling Peril, Albright argues that lack of monitoring and political will was ultimately responsible for Khan's proliferation. One of the officials he credits in the book's acknowledgment section is Mark Grossman, the U.S. Special Envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the former ambassador to Turkey. In her 2009 testimony under her oath, FBI whistleblower Sibel Edmonds confirmed that Grossman was in fact on the payroll of some of the very groups involved in the nuclear black market, and that Grossman had hindered CIA efforts to penetrate that market. Uh, one of the entries indicates nuclear secrets black market. It says, Edmonds alleges that in the course of her work for the government, she found evidence that the FBI, State Department, and Pentagon had been infiltrated by a Turkish and Israeli-run intelligence network that paid high rank officials to steal nuclear weapon secrets. Uh, when, you, when you refer to the, when the article refers to the paid high-ranking American officials, can you identify who they are? That person has been identified by others. And he has been identified as, the, uh, as Mr. Mark Grossman, uh, who used to work for the State Department. Right. And Mr. Grossman, I think, is also in your gallery, correct? Yes. Okay. And in that time, um, when he was the second or third highest ranking person at State, um, I, I've read somewhere that you, you have alleged that he actually warned the Turkish embassy about a CIA front company that had been set up to stop proliferation of nuclear weapons. That will be summer 2001, whatever yeah. title he held at that point. Yeah. Um, he, um, Mr. Grossman, uh, informed a certain uh, Turkish diplomatic entity who was also an independent operative of, uh, of uh, of a company called Brewster Jennings because Brewster Jennings was frequenting the American Turkish Council as a consulting or analyst firm and there were certain um, nuclear related operatives who wanted to hire Brewster Jennings uh, and have it pose as a front company so they were there were talks between the, those Turkish operatives and Brewster Jennings and uh, Mr. Grossman wanted those people to be warned that Brewster Jennings was a government front 
uh, front for government. And, and, and it was a front, it was not a company, it was a front for government, U.S. government, and to, for those Turkish individuals to be told to stay away from Brewster Jennings. But the person who received that information, the Turkish diplomatic but also operative, actually contacted the uh, Pakistani military attaché and discussed with the person who was there uh, about this fact and also told them, warned them to stay away from Brewster Jennings. So in the end, we have to ask ourselves what this all means. While there is no doubt that there are many dedicated and honest professionals in the Western intelligence establishment, why is it off-limits to raise the possibility that some people in key positions have their own vested interests in working against the national security of their country and in favor of such strategies as nuclear proliferation to enemy states? What progress can those on the outside of these matters possibly make in investigating these events if every act of cover-up, obstruction, and obfuscation on the part of officials, even acts that form part of an identifiable pattern, are chalked up to stupidity? Is this a fruitful avenue of research, or a way of conveniently closing down investigations of accusations of specific acts of treason committed by people in positions of power? Given the active involvement and penetration of seemingly every level of the con network by the intelligence agencies in a decades-long sting operation that ended with nuclear technology being transferred to enemies who the U.S. have long been clamoring for an excuse to go to war with, is it time to ask how much control the CIA really has over the nuclear black market, and whether this is all more than a mere question of incompetence? This video is part of a new weekly video news series. Future editions of this series will be available to subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more news and commentary from James Corbett, please visit CorbettReport.com.